And look down in the text with me to verse 68. You should have this verse underlined if you underline in your Bible. Uh, we've looked at it before in other studies, um, but it is a, a powerful verse, and for that reason deserves, as they all do, but particularly our attention. And notice the text. Very simple statement. You, referring to God, are good and do good. It's a statement that relates to God's nature and God's actions. He is good and he does good. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, 68. Oh, 68. I thought you said 58. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. You are good and do good. God is only good and God only does good. He never does anything, whatever he does, that is not good. He is good and he does good. And then you notice the second half of the verse. Teach me your statutes. And they go together. There are times in our lives where we wonder what's going on. And such is the case here with the psalmist at one point in his life. As you can see as you move through this psalm, uh, he came to the conclusion after multiple trials that it was good for him that he was afflicted. And you can see that in verse 71 that I may learn your statutes. And then you can go and um, look at verse 67 just before this. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. The psalmist recognized that even though God was bringing trials into his life and great difficulties, God was still doing good in his life. What the psalmist recognized was his lack of ability to discern God's good work in his life. And because of that, he knew what he needed to do. And he did it here in Psalm 68, or Psalm 119, verse 68. Teach me your statutes. He calls out for God, the master teacher, to teach him. And I've actually looked at this verse much deeper, and there's a, uh, a file out at our website that goes into much more depth into this verse and its significance. But a powerful verse and a verse that we can all um, go to for God's comfort. Now, obviously, we know that Jesus reiterated this very truth in the New Testament concerning the nature of God. There is none good but one, even God, right? God's goodness and the fact that God is good never changes, does it? He is good in the Old Testament. He's good in the New Testament. Is God going to be good on Judgment Day? When people are cast into hell for eternity? He will be good then, won't He? It's good that justice is executed. It's also good that mercy is executed, isn't it? God is good in the execution of both justice and mercy. And Christ received the justice do his people, right? And we received the mercy of God. It would not have been good for God to have poured out mercy at the expense of justice because that would not have been doing justice good, right? So to do both, Christ died for our sins. God then poured out his justice on Christ, that justice that was due us, and 
he poured out his mercy on us. And we became the recipients of his very specific loving kindness. What a praise that is. And so whenever we go to the Lord in prayer, we're going before God who is good. Sometimes in the answer to those prayers, he says yes, no, wait, maybe, never, and on and on and on. It's his call. And we acknowledge that by going to him in prayer and especially praying, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will, right? Because this verse doesn't say we are good and we do good, does it? No. We have a tendency to err, and God does not. So as we go to the Lord in prayer, we always remember and thank God that he is good and he does good, and we cry out to him to teach us his statutes. So having said that, a uh, brief little Bible study on Psalm 119, verse 68. Hope you can see how powerful those that verse is there, and I would encourage you to read it in the context of the whole of Psalm 119, but if you just take Psalm 119, verses 65 through 80, and read that verse in the context of those, uh, it becomes just uh, much more fruitful uh, in our minds. I'm going to ask you this evening to turn to an interesting verse. All of God's Word is interesting, but in particular tonight, open your Bibles with me to Philippians chapter 1, and we will look at a very familiar verse. And with this verse, we are going to move into multiple other verses that really do and have to do with... Um, uh, a multitude of subjects, really. One, the perseverance of the saints. Secondly, the sanctification of God's people. Uh, even regeneration, and we're going to see how all that works together. And ultimately, all of it to do with our union with Jesus Christ. But look at that sixth verse. Notice Paul's words to the believers at Philippi. For I am confident of this very thing. Stop right there for a moment. Whenever the apostle pins those words, he's doing so under the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so this is more than just an apostle's confidence, but it's at the same time the reality of a truth conveyed to us by God's Holy Spirit. And really, it's because God in, at work in the Apostle Paul and the fact that Paul has an understanding that it is God's work in the lives of all of people that he has this great confidence that he's about to state. So he says, For I am confident, of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. What is it he's confident of? First of all, that God has begun a good work in their lives. Who began the work? God began it. And the work that God began is the work, ultimately, of salvation. We could say salvation in the big sense of the word that encompasses salvation past, salvation present, salvation future. And Paul attributes it all to God. Very important, as we will move through this study this evening, as you will see. He attributes it all to God. Now, whenever we look at the actual experience of this work that God has begun— where does it start? In the life of the individual person. At what particular event? Regeneration, right? 
before regeneration, experientially speaking, there's no work there. Is there? What's their state? Lost? Dead in sin? Spiritually blind? God is not at work. They are going their own way. That makes sense? We're talking about the experiential. It, it's not to negate the truth that God certainly has chosen them in eternity past, but the choosing of them in eternity past is a different aspect of that work. It's not the actual experience in the life of the person. And that experience begins, and I believe that's ultimately what Paul has in mind here, that work begins at the new birth. Peter says that we've been born again, not of ourselves, but of the blood of Christ, of the Word of God that abides forever. God has birthed His people into His kingdom. Jesus noted to us in John 3 that the Spirit gives the new birth, right? Go with me and look at John chapter 3. Text we're familiar with. Luke, John chapter 3. John 3, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So the new birth is essential for discerning the kingdom of God. Verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You have to be born again to discern heaven. You have to be born again to get into heaven. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. God begins the new work in us in regeneration, and He does so in the work of God the Holy Spirit. That's clear. Look at John a few chapters over with me. Chapter 6. John 6 and down to verse 63. It is the Spirit who gives life. Right? It's the Spirit who gives the new life. Regeneration is the work of the Holy Spirit. And this work is a work in which God's elect are given new life. They're birthed into His kingdom. And in that new birth, we have a very specific verse in Scripture, one that I'm working to get to this evening, and we're going to look at it now. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you probably already know the verse, verse 17, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away, behold, new things have come. Look at the first part of the verse. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. It is actually said of this verse that such a person is a new creation. A new creation. Radically, spiritually different person than they were before. And it's not the old thing cleaned up. It's a new creature, a new creation, a new person. The Bible refers to him as a new man, a new heart, a heart of flesh as opposed to a heart of stone. And again, so important because in this new birth, God gives his people a brand new nature, 
a brand new nature. Some have come to this verse and they have said that this verse is not communicating the idea of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. It's not communicating the idea of a tadpole turning into a frog. The difference here is so radically different that it is really a change of species in a sense, or a caterpillar becoming a bird. That kind of difference, that kind of new creation, a creation in which we are now, and notice this, if any man be in Christ, in him, where we are joined with him experientially, by that we mean he is indwelling us, his Holy Spirit is in us. We are a new creation, a brand new creation. And that's so important because really that truth touches on and reaches into the eternal security of the believer. It reaches into those verses that Jesus spoke of in chapter 6 of John, where he said that, that he will raise such a person up. He will raise them up. These are the people who come to God, and those who come to God, Christ says he will not cast them out, but he will raise them up. We're a new creature. And one of the amazing things about being a new creature is that we have now what we never had before. And that is to the ability, not with just the ear, the physical ear, but with the spirit, the soul of this new creature, we are able to hear and discern God's word. Radically different. Before we were the new creature, we could hear it with the audible ear, but we lacked the spiritual discernment that is necessary, really, to obey and honor God, which is necessary to discern, as Jesus said in John 3, verse 3, the kingdom of God. It's impossible. But now, as a new creature, we hear his voice in an altogether different way. As a matter of fact, and go back to a text we looked at not too long ago, John chapter 5 with me. With regard to the resurrections and particularly to the new birth, you remember in John chapter 5, 20, or verse 25, Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. They will live. These are those that God, through the work of His Holy Spirit, has birthed them into His kingdom. They hear the voice of the Son of God. They live. They live. Go back a few chapters or forward a few chapters in John to chapter 27 chapter excuse me 10 verse 27 my sheep hear my voice a powerful statement my sheep there is there built into that phrase a relationship they belonged to Christ. They were given to him by the Father in eternity past. He gave his life for them on the cross of Calvary. He says of those sheep that they hear his voice. I know them and they follow me. I love that verse because two of what it doesn't say. It doesn't say my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they try to follow me. It doesn't say, some of them follow me, does it? The idea of Christ saying, and they follow me, is inclusive of all of his sheep. 
And why is it they follow him? Because they hear his voice. And how is it and why is it that they hear his voice? Because he's birthed them into his kingdom. They had the indwelling Holy Spirit. And they hear his voice. And we're not talking about something mystical here. We're not talking about extra biblical revelation. We're not talking about walking down the street one day and, and hearing an audible voice. We're not talking about something as foolish as one very well-known pastor put it, that one day God spoke to him and told him which store to turn into at a moment's notice and which turkey to buy at that store for Thanksgiving. We're talking about the voice of God in his word. In his word. Jesus said it this way. If you look over again a couple other chapters, chapter 14 with me. If you love me, verse 15, you will keep my commandments. He's not talking about, I'm going to come to you and give you extra biblical commandments. No, he's referring to the commandments of those that will, that have been and will be put into writing in what we know as the 66 books of the Bible. There were already at this time 39 books of the Bible written. And they were the word of Christ, ultimately, because Christ is God. And we know that as the next 27 books were completed, they would be conveying Christ's word to his people. Where are we going with this? Well, think of it this way. Go back to the very first verse. God began the work, didn't he? The work that he began was a new birth. And in that new birth, we heard Christ's call to salvation through the gospel message as it came to us through someone communicating it to us or reading the Bible. And in that, we believe. We believe this truth. We believe the divine revelation. His sheep hear his voice and they follow him. We are here today because that's what we are doing. And all of that is a work that God began. But he didn't just start the work, did he? Paul said there in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you will carry it out, will perfect it. He's still doing that work, right? And that work that he's doing is still through the work of his word, the washing of his word in the lives of his people. And he's going to complete it. Now, Jesus actually spoke of this in other terms. Let me give you a couple of them right offhand. Uh, we'll come back to John, but go to a familiar one in Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 23. Matthew 13, 23, in the explanation of the sower. And the one on whom the seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, and who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. What's he saying? Here's the person that the word comes to, they understand it. They hear it. They understand it. Why do they do that? We know from other texts, because God's opened their heart. He's given them that new nature. And what do they do? It's in their nature now, and the word working on that nature, that they bear fruit. They bear fruit. It's natural. They hear the word. They understand the word. They bear fruit. Look to John back there, as I mentioned to you that we would, verse or chapter 15.
John 15, 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. So, the branch that he referred to that was in him that is taken away is the branch that is superficially attached. The idea there is it appears to be. It's all external, though. It's no, there's no true union with the vine. There's no new birth there. But the branch that abides in him, and it abides in him because that's God's work. He has caused that union. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, by his doing, God's doing, you are in Christ. You are in Christ. It's God's doing. And he says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him. Notice this, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Why is it that there was a branch in him, as he said back up in verse 2, that did not bear fruit? That was the branch that was superficially attached. It's very similar to Matthew 13 here. There were those that heard the word and nothing came because for whatever reason, it was for some other reason they received it. They did not understand it. They were natural people and they believed it because they thought it could make them healthy, or they believed it because they thought the Word could make them wealthy, or they believed it because it would work in their lives to remedy some kind of earthly malady, whatever that might be, even the earthly consequences of sin. But they didn't believe it by faith because they were born again. They didn't believe it because they knew they were sinners on God's terms and needed reconciliation to Him. But those who do, those are those who are born again. Those are the ones who abide in Christ. And notice this, they bear fruit. They bear fruit. Why do they? Because they're a new creation. God has begun a work in them. He is continuing to work in them. And he is the husbandman, the farmer, as Jesus puts him here, the father is, and he's working in their lives to produce that fruit. And by the way, the fruit here can be uh, godly behavior, other Christians. It's not necessarily some specific thing. Ultimately, could all be summed up in the fruit of allegiance to God's Word. First John, go there with me. First John. We're going to look briefly at several verses here in 1 John that deal with the union of the Christian and that union yielding fruit in their lives. And we need to keep in mind, just as that text says that we started out in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, I am confident of this very thing, as Paul stated, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it. He will carry it out. So God is going to ensure that it comes to a completed end. And he's working with his word and that word on and in the life of that new creation he made in Christ. The pursuit of holiness, chapter 2, verse 1. My little children... 
So the union of Christ with God results in a fruitful life, and here one of the fruits is that pursuit of holiness. Little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. So that you may not sin. And he goes on and he says, And if someone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The point of the text is to convey that we are now on a different course. He's not saying that you're going to reach a sinless perfection in this life. But he is saying that should be the sinless perfection in eternity is our pursuit. So important. If you back up, you can see that in verse 8, but if we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. He's, again, not saying that we're not sinners and we're going to reach a state of perfection here. But what he is saying is that we need to be striving for holiness. Peter put it this way elsewhere, be you holy. For he who called you is what? Holy. And the idea of that calling is the effectual call. God has made you a new creature, suited for the pursuit of holiness. It's only natural that his people do that. It's in accord with their nature. You know, it's not in accord with the loss to pursue holiness. Is it? Not on God's terms. Not on God's terms. Maybe to pursue religion, but not to pursue holiness. Verse 24, 1 John 2 and 24. As for you, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. This is a, in conjunction with, I believe, Christ's Word, Christ Himself, the indwelling Holy Spirit, walking in obedience to Him, again, in the pursuit of holiness. Jesus said in John 15, 7, for instance, and we were just over there, if you abide in Me, and my words abide in you. He went on there in that verse and say, ask what you will in prayer and it'll be done for you. John chapter 3 and verse 3. And everyone who has this hope fixed on him, notice this, purifies himself just as he is pure. What's the hope he's talking about? Look at verse 2. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him, because we will see Him just as He is. And everyone who has this hope fixed on Him, what does He do? He purifies Himself. He's pursuing holiness, because He knows that Christ is holy, that Christ is pure. There is a desire in the people of God to be like Christ. Not to be Christ, not to be God, but to be like Him as He is without sin. To be pure, to be holy, to be pleasing before the Lord. Verse 4, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness and sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. The idea there is a person who's not in the pursuit of holiness, who's not looking to be conformed to the image of Christ, that person doesn't know him. That person has no regard for him. That person isn't concerned over the reality and the presence of sin in his or her life. It's just something they do and, oh well. The Bible speaks of those who mourn, being happy. Blessed are those who mourn. They're mourning over still sin's presence. 
another fruit in the life of the believer, and really that he encapsulates it all, as I said already, is that of allegiance to or obedience to God's Word. And, and John addresses that here too. Chapter 2, again with me, First John 2, and there to verse 4. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Remember in John 14, 15, we read earlier, if you love me, keep my commandments. Those who love Christ are those who obey his word. Not some extra biblical words, not some kind of message or mystical message, but the revelation of Scripture. Chapter 5, verses 2 and 3. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and what? Observe His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. You know, the commandments are burdensome on the life of the lost. You ever talk to someone who's trying to be saved by their works and the grief they are constantly under? the burden of that, the Christian wants God's law, loves God's law, loves His command, strives to honor God because they know that law reflects His holiness. That law is a revelation of what we are to be and to do. It's not a means of salvation. Rather, it's information for those who are saved. Conformity to Christ is another one, another fruit, a desire to be conformed to His image. We looked already at one. Look at 1 John 2 and 6 now. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. There is a fruit there. That conformity to His image, walking in the way that He walked, walking in the manner that Christ walked in. Chapter 3 and verse 2, is, we read that a moment ago. Beloved, we are children of God. Now we are children of God, and it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is, and the knowing that we will be like Him is a hope, as He brings out in verse 3. And there again, addressing that conformity to the image of Christ. Verse 7, little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, and notice this, just as He is righteous. The practicing of righteousness is likeness to Christ. And that's a fruit of being in union with Christ. That's the fruit of that new birth. The fruit of the work of that Spirit, the Holy Spirit in one's life. Look to verse 16 of the same chapter and then we'll close. We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. A life committed for the life of the brethren is like Christ, because He gave His life for the church, didn't He? That's Christ-likeness. And we'll pick up a few more of these next week whenever we come back. But really my desire in this study, one of the main things to get out of it is, and there are many, but the very fact that a person is a new creature, that puts them in union with Jesus Christ. 
And because of that union, they hear God's word. They search, they seek his word. They hear his voice. You remember Jesus in John 10? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. He's the shepherd. They are the sheep. He calls his own and his own. In John 10, he says, respond. They respond to him. He says, referring to natural sheep, another shepherd, they simply will not follow. They're not going to do it. Because why? Their voices, or excuse me, their natures are tuned to him, to Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the new birth, for making us in such a way as Christians that we hear the voice of Christ, that we are in union with him, that his words resonate within our minds and hearts, and how you work in that work we do not know, but you do. And as we hear, we follow. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.